Musta Casa Cabo, and welcome to Caciques and Semi Idols, the web spun by Taino rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. And this is part five, so we're going to be starting at chapter 14. If you haven't already been reading along with us so far, go back to the other videos and come back when you're ready for chapter 14. So the title is Semis inalienable or inalienable to give or to keep since the original formulations by Bronislav Malino Mani, Malinowski and Marcel Maus grounded on the ethno ethnology of Trobriand Islanders reciprocity has been widely regarded by anthropologists as a central and universal feature of social systems I bring Oceania and Melanesia to the fore in this section because a the theory of reciprocity is worked well developed in this region b i'm more familiar with the literature and also because c it involves islands and archipelagos the central tenet of reciprocity is that a value item is exchanged or traded for another one of similar value or worth payment in kind for gifts received could be and often was delayed but the idea is that there is a standing obligation to repay in 1992, and building on her previous work, Annette Weiner proposed that not reciprocity, but rather, quote, keeping while giving, end quote, was the universal principle governing social life, that there are things that cannot be given and that must be kept out of circulation. That is, these are ina inalienable possessions. That word gets me every time. At the same time, other things regarded as commodities could and would be recipro reciprocally exchanged. The validity of Weiner's, quote, giving for keeping, end quote, theory when confronted with ethnographic data and facts, especially in Oceania, has, in has invited intensive discussion among anthropologists. The specifics of the critiques notwithstanding, there are agreements among anthropologists of the heuristic value in considering both reciprocity and quote keeping for giving end quote in analyzing native exchange systems. The discussion in the previous section about the circulation of semis through inheritance and especially as gifts to foreign caciques raises questions regarding the nature of the exchange. Theft also arises in this inquiry precisely because it implies coming into possession of something that is not yours to keep. I assumed in this discussion that the principle and operation of gifts from deceased caciques to foreign ones was that of reciprocity, albeit delayed. I noted that a significant portion of a deceased chief's wealth would be gifted to foreigners and would be repaid at a later date upon their deaths. I suggest that the foreigners were likely allied to the deceased cacique either through marriage or through a Guatiao pact, which not always but often included women slash wife exchanges. The, fra the Spanish neither recorded the motivations behind such transactions and exchanges, nor offered any details about the notions or ideology that the natives held about the acts of giving. Taking and keeping. What is clear from the 16th century Spanish writings is that one, a good part of the estate was given away by the surviving kin of the dead cacique, thus keeping them in circulation or alienable. And two, that some quote jewels end quote and things most valued by the dead cacique would be buried with him, thus permanently permanently taken out of circulation or inalienable. The 16th century chroniclers did not mention what specific things the heir to the office of cacique and presumably his or her immediate kin would retain or keep, other than a dujo, a higuero or calabash water container, and cassava bread with fruits. No other burial items were described by the Spanish, and as already noted, the archaeology of burials in Hispaniola and Puerto Rico has so far failed to recover any rich cacique burials, precisely because of the very few offerings and artifacts interred with them. Oviedo did mention one other burial, quote, accompaniment, end quote, regarding one specific cacique. This is where both the principal wife, Acebean Eneke, and a second wife of Perma Cacique Bejequio of the Jagua chiefdom were interred alive with him when he died. But even here, Oviedo is clear in stating that such a human sacrifice, quote, was not generalized in the whole island, end quote, of Hispaniola. Despite this poverty of ethnohistoric detail, in contrast to, say, 
Chobriand, Maori, or Melanesian ethnographies, I think it's quite reasonable to assume that the heir and his or her kindred would indeed keep some of those things, things that simply could not be gifted. It is a moot question which things that were under the control of the deceased cacique were, quote, his, end quote, to bequeath, and which may have been collectively controlled by his family group or lineage, and thus for them to decide if and how they would be distributed. I have proposed that among the valuables to be given as well as those to be kept, there were semi-idols and other valued artifacts that had semi-iconography. I also suggest that the more highly valued, high-ranked, and high-status idols were perhaps not likely to be gifted, that is, they would be inalienable possessions. Am I right to assume that the most senior, potent, and powerful icons could not be given under any circumstances? Probably not. But if given, such a gift would be of supreme political importance between two communities. It's thus worth re-examining the issues of alienable, or can be given, and inalienable, must be kept, semi-icons, taking into account that singular semi-icons definitively had different values owing to their variable rank statuses and demonstrated powers and efficacy. Much like the Elgin marbles, whatever happens to these objects, they are perceived to belong in an inherent way to their original owners, i.e. the Greek, not the British. Inalienable possessions are imbued with affective qualities, as is the semi, that are expressions of the value an object has when it's kept by its owner and inherited within the same family or descent group. Age, or antiquity, adds value, as does the ability to keep the object against all exigencies that might force a person or a group to release it to others. The primary valuable of inalienability, however, is expressed through the power these objects have to define who one is in a historical sense. The, objects, the object acts as a vehicle for bringing past time into the present, so that the histories of ancestors, titles, or mythological events become an intimate part of a person's, example, in our case, the cacique's, present identity. To lose this claim to the past is to lose part of who one is in the present. It is, in its inalienability, the object must be seen as more than an economic resource, i.e. commodity, and more than an affirmation of social relations. For those unfamiliar, for years now, there's been a heated debate about the rightful ownership of the mar marble sculptures of the Parthenon Frias, which were lifted by the Earl of Elgin, hence the subcreate Elgin marbles, at the beginning of the 19th century and bought on behalf of the British nation by the British Museum in 1816. On the one hand, the debate revolves around the question of legitimate ownership in the legal sense, and on the other, about who has the right to own a people's cultural heritage and history. Despite claims by the Greek government, the British government has refused their return to Greece. The British public and individual parliamentarians, however, are equally divided in their opinions about ownership, albeit the return to Greece. Advocates among the public seem to be gaining ground. Regardless of the issue of legal ownership, there is an acknowledgement that the Elgin marbles are, quote, inalienably end quote, linked to their ancient Greek authors and thus to modern Greeks. Following Weiner's arguments, keeping instead of giving inalienable possessions enables the, quote, owners, end quote, examples, the caciques, heirs, and their king groups to validate their rank and hierarchy. As Moscow noted, in adopting Weiner's position, the consequence is that, quote, the preponderance of exchanges typically involves alienable possessions interpreted as strategic attempts to avoid or giving exchanging the crucial hierarchical preserving inalienable possessions, end quote. In contrast, for Weiner, the inalienable possessions, end quote, endure beyond the lives of humans, end quote, reaffirming that the latter possessions were, quote, undoubtedly employed in the validation and demonstration of the identity, rank, authority, status of groups rather than individuals, end quote. That is, the objects were curated and kept to validate and reinforce the groups and the chief standing. But Weiner also noted a fundamental paradox in her position, in, in her proposition, rather. She found ethnographic evidence in Melanesian in Melanesia, that inalienable possessions can also 
be exchanged, lost, or destroyed, in which case, as Mosco noted, it would, or did, undermine the owner's claims to his possession and standing in society. Where does this leave the argument for the existence of things that are inalienable? Moscow's principal critique of Weiner's thesis was that the concept of Melanesian personhood deployed by her were, quote, isomorphic with long-standing Western presuppositions, end quote, where persons and things, subjects and objects are viewed as unitary or bounded instead of partible, partible or individual, quote, entities, end quote that the assumed indivisibility and individuality of persons and things is inappropriate becomes especially evident in many native Melanesian and generally oceanic theories of conception, those involving blood, semen, and other substances, in accounting for the formation and subsequent changes of personhood through the life and afterlife of human beings, where the processes involved are first the decomposition of the person followed by his recomposition into another still individual person, which also have a very different nature. Example, an ancestral idol, an intangible spirit or soul, etc. Sadly, the Taino and notions about procreation and of life, death, rebirth cycles are essentially unknown, though they're indirectly expressed in the language of myth. The Spanish did not record any native theories about how bones, blood, semen, and other substances contributed to the composition of personhood, of what parts were contributed by the mother's or father's lineage to ego, and how these substances were decomposed and recomposed in, for example, rites of passage such as birth, puberty, marriage, and funerals. Nevertheless, as I have suggested above for the natives of Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and as Strathern has suggested for Melanesian societies, if the construction of personhood is individual, partible, or fractal, it would account, I think, for the paradox that things and persons regarded as inalienable in Weiner's logic were in fact being exchanged. As partible as individual entities, the agency in any exchange is in the relationship elicited or displayed by the parts owned by a person and owed to other persons. This raises the question of whether the mutually exclusive categories of alienable and inalienable are adequate, since some parts or aspects, rather than whole units making up personhood, could be given or shared and others kept. So to speak, the boundary of a person does not end at the skin of its body, nor in the body a bounded, indivisible entity, be it human beings or other beings and things. In Melanesia, Kula, Mapula, and Lisaladabu, not sure if I said that right, but these things exchange systems. These were certain items and things that, despite being given, nevertheless still, quote, attached, end quote, to their original source, that is, the giver or his group. These were, of course, symbolic attachments in the sense that geographic distance and physical separation existed between the giver and taker and the entity, quote, object, end quote, taken. Despite being kept, used, or displayed by the taker, some constitutive, constitutive parts of items or entities would remain inherently bound to the giver, since subjects and objects are not conceived as indivisible unitary entities. Commenting on Strathern's work, Moskow further observed, Melanesian persons are best understood as individual or partible agents and patients who, in seeming to exchange objects with, uh, with one another, detach and attach respective parts of persons, relations or parts of other persons detached and attached in prior exchanges. As there is no absolute distinction between subjects and objects as persons and things they exchange in these contexts, the Western notions of, quote, ownership, end quote, or, quote, possession, end quote, would seem incongruous with indigenous Melanesian per precepts. Manufactured, manufactured objects need not bear any intrinsic relation of ownership to their makers or possessors, nor need they be singularly gendered as either male or female, since people detach and attach different parts or relations of their persons in different contexts of exchange. Object, objects which might be taken as movable, i.e. alienable, may in other circumstances be seen as immovable, immovable or inalienable. As a result, it's not paradoxical that sometimes inalienable possessions can be or are exchanged, destroyed, or lost, and it's not necessarily the case that relinquishment of certain parts of persons, supposedly inalienable possessions, result in the loss of hierarchical standing. Thus, 
In the Melanesian case, agents and actors or persons can keep certain parts of themselves while simultaneously giving other parts of them in each transaction. Quote, it is the giving and mutual elicitation both within and between groups where agency and sociality lie. End quote. Unlike Weiner, for Strathern and Moskal, alien, alien, inalienability is a central aspect of the concept of gift exchange rather than a substitute. Weiner's theory of, quote, keeping while giving, end quote, also intended to account for, quote, the temporal aspects of the movements of persons and possessions and the cultural configurations that limit or expand the reproduction or dissipation of social and political relationships through time, end quote, asserting that, quote, social value must be created and recreated to prevent or overcome dissipation or loss, end quote. Moscow, however, shows that there is abundant Melanesian ethnographic count counter evidence suggesting instead that, quote, a dual or cyclical process, quote, is at stake, quote, consisting of the need first to affect dissipation and loss through intentional disintegration of persons and relationship characteristically enacted in mortuary rituals as a preliminary and second to the expansive creation of new persons or relations through new or additional exchanges, end quote. Fundamentally, Weiner's portrayal of the inalienable possessions of social reproduction is represented as, quote, perpetual or undirectional trajectory of creating and recreating social values so as to prevent or limit loss and decay, end quote, or dissipation, whereas for Moscow, quote, social reproduction consists in the countervailing trajectories of both social reduction and social expansion, where the dissipation of social values must not, be, must not be prevented but deliberately affected or decomposed, deconceived, before they can be recreated in the production of new persons and relations. And this process of alternating personal and social contraction and expansion is an inherently temporal one, end quote. The strength of anthropological debate about the nature of gift exchange lies in the rich corpus of ethnographic evidence that's available in Melanesia and generally in the Pacific. To, evalu the, to evaluate these competing positions, which in turn provide invaluable ammunition and insight for archaeological research in the region. By comparison, the data available for 16th century Taino and other greater Antillean natives is far more limited and incomplete. Although natives did not entirely disappear from the large islands, such as in Cuba and Hispaniola, by the 17th century, a very different native ethnic social order, or indios, emerged. But just because such richness of evidence is lacking in the Caribbean does not mean these theoretical approaches should be ignored. They ought to be considered and discussed, even if they remain just theoretical propositions, and even if there's a danger of overinterpretation. After all, both theoretical formulations, reciprocity and, quote, keeping while giving, end quote, are meant to have universal application. The fact remains that a great deal of the discussion about trade and exchange in the pre-Columbian and initial Spanish contact period in the Caribbean has been made under the Western assumption of the indivisibility and unity of persons and the things exchanged and where exchanges are also based on Western notions of economics. Such assumptions have spilled onto the methods by which archaeologists and ethno-historians ethno have generally categorized Aboriginal material culture. Most, if not all, of the classifications and tabulations of artifacts in archaeological reports is based on the principle that even when fragmented, these artifacts represent indivisible units or ideal types or individuals as seen in minimum number of individuals. This is fine to address any number of research questions, but I think it's inappropriate when, for example, one wishes to address questions of sociality and meanings involved in trade and exchange. The agent-patient relationship I have thus far noted between semi-idols, semi as idols and as spirits, and human beings strongly suggests that, like in Melanesia, these relationships are based on notions of partable and individual personhoods. Furthermore, there is some evidence already presented to suggest that these idols are individual persons, given the animistic and multinaturalistic perspective of the natives and other neighboring cultures participating in Dainones. If so, when it seems likely that the, quote, subject objects, end quote, in the exchange relation involving highly valued semi-idols could be gifted, given appropriate circumstances, as these gifts will still have a part of their personhood attached to the donor.
The case of the gift of the areto is a good indication that immensely valuable and seemingly inalienable, inalienable things were in fact given in exchange for military protection, and that what was given through sacred words and dances was the history of deeds and geneal genealogical connections held by the donor cacique to the other cacique. Thus this gift was so valuable that it would be dishonorable to refuse it. It would make sense, although it's impossible to prove or disprove with the available ethno-historic evidence, that in this case, the donor cacique will always be inherently, inherently or inalienably attached to this areto gift, while the receiving cacique would now share in the past glories and, histori and, and history commemorated by the sacred texts and dances given by the, quote, foreign, end quote, cacique of Magua. It is also a logical conclusion that the precious gift of areto would not be given in most other circumstances. What was at stake in this areto exchange was the very survival of the cacique and his cacicazo. The sacred text and dance choreography of an areto can be conceptualized as parts that define and, con and constitute the personhood of the cacique. The gift thus involves giving away that which defines the person who is to be assumed and internalized by the receiving cacique. In other momentous occasions, such as the marriage or death of caciques, other equivalent valuables, such as potent semi-idols, would be similarly exchanged, entailing new social relations between the exchange parties and parts of persons being given, recompose the person, given, recompose the personhood of others. To use Moscow's terminology, these potent semis and aretos and other like materials and things are thus, quote, movable, end quote, expressions, the gifts, or semis, comprise the giver's distributed person. In the case of giving semi-idols be, as bequests among foreign caciques, the result is a cross-generational circulation and redistribution of these objects. From the perspective of the gifted semi-idol, rather than the human beings in the exchange web, their relationships with different generations of deceased caciques signify that the parts of the idol's personhood that make up its legend or biography will always be, quote, attached, end quote, to a string or series of former human trustees, including deceased ones, in addition to the current human cacique trustee. The one thing that is constant and unchanging is their condition of being sweet and potent, which makes semi-idols different from any ordinary living human being. Humans can benefit from or feel the adverse effects of semi-agency, but I doubt that any living human could have the condition of being semi except in the afterlife. On the other hand, reciprocal relations between living humans and semi-idols exist. Semis are cared for, venerated, and given houses for prayer and gardens to cultivate the foods that will be offered in exchange for their favorable intervention in making things and events happen. A human cacique giving semi-idols and other things, example, areto, which at first glance seem to be inalienable, quote, possessions, end quote, to foreign caciques does not mean that his heirs, his lineage group, will lose strength and dissipate power, rank, or status. The social relationship that the giver has held with the semi-idols and which define their mutual personhoods while the relationship lasted will be attached to the semi and its new owner and preserved in the biography and legend of the idol long after the death of the caciques. Aside from all other relationships that define the cacique in life, part of his personhood is defined by the reciprocal exchanges he'd engaged in with his semi-idol, example, food offering or observing taboos for a favorable semi-intervention. Much the same could be said if some highly valued semis were gifted in life, perhaps as bride or groom price or in exchange of political packs, such as the areto example described earlier. Relinquishing powerful semis, like giving away wives and, and aretos, would not dissipate power, but would redefine and strengthen relations of power among caciques. Reciprocity, then, is the key principle behind the circulation of valuable, potent objects and things. The reciprocal exchange system thus seems to ensure that the network of mutual, chiefly alliances and relations is maintained and reproduced, if not expanded, social or more accurately socio-political. Reproduction in the case of the Taino chiefs depend, depends on giving these valuables for precisely, quote, keeping, quote, power. Thus, reciprocity is fundamental. It works because the heir of the dead cacique who had to give away a valued semi-idol and any other valuables knows that his turn will come to receive in kind. For a neophyte cacique, such support is crucial in the face of enemy chiefs, competing faction within his polity, and to win the confidence of skeptical communities within his chiefdom. More important, 
One of the ways in which semi-idols accrue reputation and attain legendary status is by changing hands, thus adding to their biography, new relationships with powerful humans. The more powerful the human trustee, the more effective will be the transformation of semi-potency into action. This can only occur in two ways. One, semis are inherited by heirs and kept, quote, in-house, end quote, or two, they're gifted to foreign caciques. The first instant has the advantage that the powerful semi-idols are kept under the, the direct control of the new chiefs and his lineage, thus ensuring the concentration of political religious power. The disadvantage of, quote, keeping, end quote, is that the new heir's abilities and power to control and negotiate the semi-idols is as yet untested. They're likely to be mismatched initially. In the second instance, the advantage of, quote, giving, end quote, is that the, quote, taker, end quote, is likely to already be a senior, reputable, and well-tested well cacique, and thus the relationship with the acquired semi-idol will be even more evenly matched. In turn, the semi-idol's reputation, given a more effective negotiating control by the cacique, would increase its reputation and thus become even more valuable. The disadvantage is that the, give, is that the quote, giver, end quote, no longer has direct physical access to this icon in order to negotiate or extract from the semi-idol what it needs to rule. The delayed reciprocal exchange of the valued semi-idols ensures that every time a cacique dies, a valued semi-idol will, with increased reputation, will be received by someone who can, quote, handle, end quote, it. Large three-pointed stones, elbow stones, or stone collars, as well as necklaces, pendants, and other artifacts of chiefly regalia with semi-iconography will pass on as heirlooms. Others will be given to allies, and still others will be newly created to, perhaps, commemorate ascension to the office. For a newly minted semi to become legendary will depend on the abilities of the cacique to control it and deliver the, quote, goods, end quote. This takes time and maturation as a political religious leader. There is one last observation to be made. To rule and to engage the semis as idols and also semis as spirits in the council house requires the physical presence of the idols. Proof of this is the necessity to steal semi-idols between competing caciques. A physical proximity to the semi-idols is required in order to control and rule. It's for this reason that I'm quite certain that even when valuable semi-idols would be gifted or bequeathed, many of the caciques' arsenal of semi-idols, or at least those that Columbus noted, were the central figures of veneration and would have been gifted only in exceptional circumstances. This is as far as one can argue the issue of which semi-idol Idols could or could not be given based on the available data from ethnohistoric documents. To borrow Weiner's phrase, the semi-idols, especially those with the thick biography and legendary status, quote, have the power to define who one is in a historical sense, end quote. They're enmeshed in a network of reciprocal exchanges that define and redefine them as persons. As persons, the semi are engaged in webs of social relationships with human beings that also define and redefine who they are. The personal histories and identities of the caciques participating in this exchange are as much defined and redefined by what they give as by what they take and keep. If there is one artifact of choice that exemplifies the complex nature of reciprocal interactions between caciques and idols, then this must be the stone collar. Scrolling and... We are now at part four, stone collars, elbow stones, three pointers, stone heads, and guaisas. Scrolling to the next chapter. Chapter 15, stone collars, elbow stones, and caciques. The stone collars and elbow stones are visually complex artifacts, and when the lateral and upper panels are decorated, they truly display the virtuosity of Taino and craftsmanship. Like many of the other semi-idols, iconic or otherwise, both elbow stones and collars appear to have pre taino roots, i.e. the Osteonin and Elenin Osteonoid periods, possibly as early as AD 600 or AD 700. Because elbow stones have the same size and dimensions as the, quote, elbow, end quote, portion of the monolithic stone collar, several other, other, other archaeologists, for instance, Ricardo Alegria, have suggested that these were essentially collars that were made of part stone, or the elbow, with the rest of the arc or ring made from other materials, most likely wood or henequeng. <laughs> 
of fiber cordage. Others have suggested that they may be salvaged stone collars. This led them to propose that the composite cordage slash wood and stone elbow is the antecedent for the all stone collars. As we shall see, stone collars were also combined with three-pointed stone semis to form a single yet compound object. The narrow, slender ring part of the stone collar is clearly a stone sculptured rendition of another object made of bent wood that was tied to the two distal ends of the elbow part, visible as a knot or notch in the all-lithic version. Logic would dictate that it was the wood and stone wood and stone elbow that gave rise to the all stone version but contrary to conventional wisdom walker has persuasively argued that the monolithic collars were not derived from the elbow stones but quite the contrary jeff walker is very persuasive in showing through stylistic quote generative grammar end quote and technological analyses why the reverse is more likely Stone collars evolved from the massive bench type to the slender frame type along with increasingly decorative complexity over time. In parallel, the ancient miniature three-pointed stones also evolved into increasingly larger and more richly decorated forms. Late in the sequence, elbow stones appeared. The key feature of elbow stones is the frame forming the undecorated panels, which is, light, which is linked to the late later slender collars and not the earlier massive collars. Walker concludes that, quote, the elbow stone must have come into being during the final decline of massive collars when they began to evolve in slender forms, end quote. Walker further argues that these elbow stones were, quote, abbreviated forms, end quote, of the all stone collars. Quote, I suggest that they were an economical version of the combined stone collar slash three pointer form. The most labor-intensive part of making both of these artifacts was the first stage of shaping, particularly the initial hollowing out of both sides of the stone slab to form the ring of the collar and the subsequent shaping and engraving of the exterior designs. Abbreviating the ring portion, in essence by making an elbow stone, would have saved a great deal of time and labor. With faced elbow stones, only one artifact, an elbow stone, needs to be shaped." End quote. Walker observed, that labor and time saving was furthermore enhanced by the fact that many of the elbow stones were made of softer rock materials such as limestone that would have been relatively easier to work with than igneous material used for the all stone collars moreover given that the decorated panel in some elbow stones depicts a two-dimensional iconogra icon iconographic version of the three-dimensional three-pointed stone semi this quote faced elbow stone was designed to be used as an economical substitute end quote for the all stone collar and its attached sculptured three pointer. The function and meaning of the all stone collars and the elbow stones, that is, the composite wood slash fiber plus the elbow stone, are clouded in mystery because the Spanish chroniclers never mentioned or described them and because very few specimens have been found in secure archaeological contexts. Thus, before going into a discussion of function and meaning, it's worth first discuss discussing their formal attributes, a task made infinitely easier thanks to Walker's doctoral research on these objects. The, the next few pages will endeavor to address the question of how they were used, human object interaction, and by whom, what the meanings of the iconographic motives were, whether they were imbued with semi, and finally to evaluate whether they were alienable or inalienable, quote, possessions, end quote. So section A, formal attributes. Conventionally, the all stone collars have been classed in terms of the relative cross-section thickness as either slender or massive. Generally, the slender stone collars present highly polished surfaces, whereas the massive ones usually have a coarser surface finish. There are a number of either type that bear no decoration, but most of them, particularly the slender monolithic collars, are decorated. The iconography and the decorative motives of both types of collars are visually complex. This is in large measure because of the physical limitations imposed by the curved, relatively narrow decorative fields. The motifs and icons to be carved must therefore be arranged so as to fit these decorative fields. Viewed from above, the shape of the stone collar varies from moderately to markedly oval and eccentric, with two modal tendencies. One is the bench mode, which is somewhat more circular in outline. The, the bench mode is associated 
oh, excuse me. One is the bench mode, which is somewhat more circular in outline, whereas the other is the frame mode. The bench mode is associated with massive collars, while the frame is associated with slender collars. The slender collars thicken toward the distal end, whereas the proximal end, the ring, tends to be very thin and slender. On one side, the slender collar segment links to the lower panel by a protuberance or projection, but it's the distal section that bears, bears all the decoration when present. There are two relatively broad panels on each side toward the apex of the collar. One is, lat one is a lateral lower panel, which is frequently decorated. The other panel is on the opposite side, also placed laterally, and is undecorated, although it may have an oval concavity. Both massive and slender collars have these lower lateral panels. There's also a decorated upper panel found only on slender collars. That bears iconography, sculptured in relief. This panel often displays what Walker has called a, quote, central figure, end quote. Walker has proposed a seriation or progression of design development based on the reasonable premise that the massive bench type of stone collar was the earlier form. This form gradually evolves into the slender frame type. One of the early dominant motifs is the, quote, headless fish, end quote. It is a clear and lone design at the beginning of the sequence, but by its midpoint, this design has become substantially stylized and some of its key elements serve supporting roles for more recently introduced designs. For example, the fins become the bird frog beaks and only in outline do they retain their original form and meaning. By the end of the sequence, the headless fish has become so passe, it's relegated to the role of a border or frame of newer motifs and occasionally previously critical elements almost disappear. Example, the tail becomes less and less defined through the sequence, and at least in one example, it's all but absent. The serial progression begins with an image or icon that is displayed in the lateral panel and is visually cued by the knob shape of the distal portion of the collar. Walker labeled his iconic motif the, quote, headless fish, end quote. This image indeed evokes the headless body of a fish, with its tail fin being the key visual cue, hence less likely to be that of a saurian, like a lizard, iguana, or snake. The absent head, however, is visually insinuated in some specimens by the protruding knob as a, quote, head, end quote, at the distal end of the collar. The second motif in the proposed sequence involves what Walker identifies as the, quote, big bird frog twin, end quote, an image that emerges when viewing the upper and lateral decorated panels from a lateral perspective. The wing elements and the nose of the bird strongly suggest to me that the biological model is a bat rather than generic birds. When looking at the upper panel from the top with the collar resting flat on the ground, the twin icons that emerge are in essence the head with eyes and mouth, sometimes also nostrils marked an upper torso, torso of two personages that may or may not be frogs. Invariably, as Walker noted, these two personages are presented opposing each other. If one focuses the view on the lateral profile of the collar and stands it vertical, yet another image emerges. The head or upper torso, the head upper torso personage instead appears in profile and kneeling, more human-like. The revelation of different images depending on the viewer's perspective relative to the collar's position is anatropic. As one rotates the objects, new images become salient and others become hidden. Yet the visible and hidden personages are always comprised with a single, quote, body, end quote, visually cued by the design elements of the panel. This is another excellent example of two key features of Thainonis, multinatural perspectivism and individuality. The stone collars embody different identities and personages that are visible only from different focal points, but at the same time, they're articulated into a single entity. This scenario is made even more complex by the proposed attachment of three-pointed semi idols on the lateral undecorated panel of slender collars. Most likely those semi idols that have the head design sculptured in the apex rather than on either of the lateral protuberances. The third iconic theme is an elaboration of the former, which may have developed after or at the time as Walker's, quote, big frog twin, end quote, motif of the upper decorated panel. Instead of a single pair of opposing personages, there are four. Walker named this motif the, quote, double twin bird frog, end quote. When looking at the upper decorated panel from a lateral perspective and with the collar resting on the ground or horizontal and at the lower lateral decorated panel, what emerges is a bicephalous creature, two heads, four pairs of eyes, 
united by a single body with a design that is, quote, classic Taino, end quote, or chicken osteonoid. The central circle and dot depicting the abdomen framed by triangular shaped feet that appear to suggest the legs are crossed. The same abdomen feet features are also displayed by the central anthropozoomorphic semi semi petroglyphs of Caguana. The hands and the stone collar are also triangular in shape but rest on the abdominal abdominal area, a posture that is also adopted in many Taino and anthropozoomorphic icons and idols executed in various media. Although the shape of the hands and feet are suggestive of frogs, these formal conventions are not limited to just frogs, but may also be portrayed in human-like figures and in combined animal-human figures, again an indication of the multiple authorship of the identities and personhood of the personages portrayed. Thus, this is a single-bodied personages characterized personage characterized by a, quote, fantastic, end quote, double head. Finally, when one looks at the stone collar set in a vertical position and focuses on the two pairs of the opposing twins, the personages are kneeling or bent low or have bent lower legs, a posture that is much more suggestive of a human rather than an animal-like being. This alterity between human-like and frog-like personages in cheek and osteonoid icons has earlier antecedents in a Lenin, Oste a Lenin osteonoid ceramics. The last addition in Walker's proposed sequence of stone collars is what he calls the quote central figure, end quote. This icon is always or almost always that of a bat personages, personage, which is placed at the center of the decorated panel and can straddle into the upper decorated panel. The bat icon is, however, only visible to the viewer when the stone collar is positioned laterally. As soon as one views it from the top, the bat personage disappears and the simple or double twin personages emerge. The elbow stones, like their all stone counterparts, also have an undecorated panel for attaching three pointed semis. Presumably, as Walker noted, at a late point in the sequence, the three dimensional semi icon, particularly the three pointed type, bearing facial motifs on the apex rather than lateral prominences, was replaced by a two dimensional rendition directly on the panel of the elbow. These faced elbow stones invariably depict anthropomorphic personages, sometimes full bodied, but most often showing only the head portion. Accepting that three pointed stones are semis, there is little question that the faced elbow stones and stone collars with attached three pointed stones must therefore also be semi. This is a composite comprising several semi beings in close articulation with one, an with one another and with the human quote owner end quote. This relation between human beings and animal entities may not be just about an animistic perspective, but also seems to suggest elements of totemism at work. There seems to be a special relationship between the social group and animals. In the Caribbean examples, example, the stone collars or, or in ceramic lugs, the concept of multiple natures is important. There are frogs as frogs, and then there are frog-like beings in alterity and in synthesis with human-like beings. An analysis of the Hispaniolan myths collected by Ramon Pané leads me to think that the concept of animals being human-like and vice versa goes back to notions of primordial time in the cosmos when that state of being and of sociality, or, quote, paradise, end quote, was the modus vivendi for all beings and things, but all that was lost to humanity at some point in time. Yet ordinary humans in the present world regain access to this primordial domain thanks to Deminan Caracaracol and his three identities identical brothers, the cultural heroes who revealed to humans the, quote, secrets, end quote, of coho bat tobacco, medicines, religious ceremonies, and so on. Only through ritual performances, especially the coho bat, could an ordinary being once again experience, at least for a while, that primordial, original state of being and commune with the numinous or mythical beings with, quote, man frogs, end quote, quote, bat men, end quote, and so forth. It is a mistake, I think, to assume that the natives thought of this primordial, primordial mythical cosmos as a, th as a thing of the deep past, in ilio tempore. Rather, this primordial domain is omnipresent, in the here and now, but only accessible through proper ritual preparation, example, fasting, vomiting, and execution, cojova, aretos, funerary feasts, etc., to summarize, I suspect that the, quote, utopian, end quote, ideal of total taino for an ordinary human being, for an ordinary human may well have been to pre permanently regain that primordial state of being. 
I get the feeling that the native sense of, quote, paradise and afterlife, end quote, would be precisely to return to the way things ought to be in communion with all primordial beings. In a sense, these mythical animal and human being, these mythical animal and human-like beings were the ancestral community of personages of the ordinary human society. If this is correct, if this is a correct interpretation, then this special relationship with animals besides plants and other numinous things in nature is suggestive of some elements of totemism. All of this would also relate to Alfred Gell's idea of the distributed person as it applies to human beings and their objects of art and their outward manifestations of, quote, divinity, end quote, or totems. The issue of how well-developed or central totemism is as an element of Thayenonis needs further research, which I believe for a future opportunity. Overall, I think that the animistic perspective more comfortably fits the data available. Section B, Archaeological Context. It goes without saying that stone collars and elbow stones were expensive or produced in terms of invested time and labor. I have already commented earlier that on average there were between 10 and 17 of these items completed per year over a stretch of 700 years or so. In short, they are rare, infrequent items and a finite archaeological resource. Sadly, the advent of intensive collectionism toward the end of the 19th century means that theoretically very few stone collars and elbow stones, particularly complete specimens, remain for archaeologists to recover today. Jeff Walker and others have noted a high concentration of blanks or remnants of the initial shaping of the stone collars that are found piled up at the Civic Ceremonial Center of Caguana in Puerto Rico. Although these look like metates or milling stones, they undoubtedly represent the early stages of the manufacture of collars. They show concave depressions on both sides, some showing the beginnings of the central perforation of the rings. Most of these unfinished stone collars or elbow stones are not from Caguana itself, but come from its immediate vicinity, a region characterized by dispersed farmstead settlements sprinkled between the karst hills and small valleys or dolines. Research in this 15 to 20 kilometer area, kilometer squared area to date has yielded the following data. An unfinished elbow stone was found in a Batay site just 2.5 kilometers north of Caguana. Another fragment of a massive bench type limestone collar or undecorated along with a large quote half moon and quote type of three pointed stone were, re were recovered in 1996 on the surface of another single Bate site, located only 1.5 kilometers east of, um, it says CAG-3, but I'm assuming that's an area in Caguana. These two items were piled together in what was once the edge of the Bate, along with the few loose Bate stones, the result of clearing for modern farming activities right on top of the Bate. At the Vega de Nilo Vargas site, just 1.5 kilometers east of Caguana, Two mended fragments of the lower panel were found in a domestic refuse midden next to a small bate. The panel surface is still rough, which suggests that it was never finished. Possibly it fractured during manufacture or the material was defective and thus discarded. In any event, it seems that the farmstead sites were producing and are domestically using slender and massive stone collars, and there's a good chance, but not yet proven, that part of the far farmstead production was controlled or demanded by the cacique of Caguana. This pile of unfinished stone collars represents the highest known concentration of partly worked blanks in Puerto Rico, if not the Caribbean. Pedro Ava Alvarado also informs me that a complete slender stone collar was found at the top of a mountain peak that forms the dome of Cueva, Cueva del Lucero, a cave replete with pictographs and petroglyphs located near Juana Diaz, Puerto Rico. At the base of the mountain, there is also an occupation site with scattered surface materials that include, quote, modified, end quote, ostiones and capa ceramic styles. Neither the cave nor the site below has been archaeologically excavated yet, albeit most of the pictographic art found at the Lucero Cave is in the Chican ostionoid styles. Also in Puerto Rico, Renier Rodriguez Ramos reported a panel portion of a possible slender collar fragment at the Rio Tanama site near Arecibo associated with Cueva slash Ostiones style, AD 440 to 850, as well as other fragments found at the sites of Tibes in Ponce, 
uh, Caguitas and Caguas and Tierra Nueva in Manati, associated with Montserrat, Ostion, Ostiones, Ostiones, uh, Santa Elena styles. At the Source site on Vieques Island, a coarse fragment was found in association with what appears to be a cueva slash pure Ostiones deposit. In short, stone collars predate A.D. 1200 to 1300, the time when the Chican Ostianoi styles of Capa and Esperanza developed in Puerto Rico. In the Eastern Dominican Republic, slender and massive stone collar fragments have been recovered from a number of sites between Santo Domingo and Punta Macao. However, most have, ne have neither contextual data nor published reports. Punta Macao, Altagracia Higüey, is typical. Based on my conversations in 2004 with Gabriel Atiles, who directed extensive salvage work there at the end of the 1900s, I'm aware that several stone collar fragments were found during excavations, but no report has been forthcoming, and it's unlikely one will ever be published. The one site where good data exists is at the El Cabo site, Cabo de San Rafael, Higüe, where a limestone collar fragment was found during preliminary tests conducted in El Pidio Ortega, in a midden deposit and possibly related to the earlier Ostionin, Ostionoid assemblage, an Aden and, quote, transitional, transitional, I guess, end quote, ceramic styles. In the latest excavations conducted in 2005 and 2006, the Anglo-Dutch team found two slender stone collar fragments, both made of imported igneous rock. The nearest possible igneous source is in the Cordillera Oriental around El Sable to the northwest. Both specimens were located in a domestic contents within a few centimeters of the basal coralliferous limestone bedrock and associated with Boca Chica or Taino in pottery and other artifacts. The 300 millimeter, the 300 meter squared excavated domesticated domestic area is perforated with several hundred posts and pit holes from which at least three clear round structures or bogios have been defined. It's the clearest evidence thus far published of slender stone collars in association with houses in Hispaniola. Walker has found indications that in some instances, stone collars and three-pointed semis were acquired or donated to museums together as a set, that both were found together. He cites Samuel K. Lothrop's comment that a stone collar and a three-pointed were found together on an unspecified site in Manati region, which he could not verify, although he suggests that these are likely two specimens now at the Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte, Universi uh, University of Puerto Rico. Another stone collar of the slender type and a three-pointer were found by workmen digging holes for a water pump station at Los Indios, near the town of Santa Isabel, uh, south coast of Puerto Rico. These two specimens acquired by Dr. Montalvo Guenard, a prolific private collector in Puerto Rico in the 1930s, were said to have been found, quote, near a metate, end quote, which Walker argues was more likely to be a turen, or stone seat, or perhaps a stone collar blank. Walker found three three-pointed semis from Los Indios, formerly in Guenard's collection, one of which is almost certainly the one found along with the slender collar. In another instance, an elbow stone and a three-pointer were found at a site, quote, on the property of Domingo Mundo, near the marketplace of Salinas, end quote, on the south coast of Puerto Rico. To these, one can add the samples from site Utuado 20, already mentioned above. In sum, although these are tentative associations, I agree with Walker's reasons based on morpho morphological and technological attributes relating both artifacts for considering the pairing of semis and stone collars as probable rather than improbable correlation. To conclude, the immense majority of elbow stones and stone collars do not come from archaeologically controlled contexts, but the above samples of known contexts suggest that these artifacts even seen different stages of production rather than as finished products, are found in a broad range of contexts, from civic ceremonial centers to domestic habitation and midden refuse. It must be kept in mind that the samples with known contexts are all fragmentary, some have faults and being discarded, and others left unfinished for whatever reason. Walker's study on the museum samples of elbow stones and collars in Puerto Rico shows that they were often found in association with sites that have or once had stone demarcated precincts. 
like plazas or ball courts, while specimens held at the University of Puerto Rico suggest at least some stone collars and elbow stones were probably found together as a set. Given these diverse contexts, the subsection addresses the questions of the functions of stone collars and elbow stones, how they were used and who might have controlled or used them. In Walker's words, quote, what is not an issue is that stone collars are found at ceremonial ball court sites. The archaeological evidence indicates that stone collars are associated with these types of sites. What is still at issue is whether the stone collar was, one, worn at all or used as a non-corporeal sacred object, two, worn diagonally across the chest like a bandolier, and three, worn by all players during games of bate, Lastly, four, whether ball games were ever played at the ceremonial site, end quote. Section C, function and use of stone collars and elbow stones. Jesse Fuchs had long ago proposed that stone collars and elbow stones could be A, an insignia of office worn on the person, B, a sacrificial object, C, idols for animal worship, such as serpents and lizards, D, idols for tree or plant worship, especially manioc, or E, a collar for men or women dragging canoes. One of the most popular theories was, and for many still is, that the stone collars were used around the belt by players engaged in the Antillian ball game, or that they were, quote, ceremonial, end quote, stone replicas of the actual belts used. The, quote, collar, end quote, label came from the Puerto Rico peasants, who also called them yugos, an analogy to the yokes worn by beasts of burden. The collar idea that was picked up by J.B. Holder in 1875 and Otis Mason in 1877 has stuck as a name regardless of whether they were functionally collars or not. However, I favor Jeff Walker's view that these objects were items associated with chiefly power and regalia and that they were likely a combination of heraldic and emblematic objects used by caciques in ritual theater. They were among the personal possessions of a cacique and most likely meant for public display only during particular ceremony of ceremonial events, figuring out if and how they might have been worn by a human being would point to some of their possible uses and functions. Walker, who has extensively researched stone collars and elbow stones, concluded, on the first point, whether the stone rings were worn, I believe they were. There's uniformity to the interior of the collars. Whatever their exterior shapes, be they massive or slender, the interior shape and size are about the same, a consistency which far exceeds the exterior of these collars. This is fairly conclusive evidence that uniformity was intentionally sought for some purpose, and I see no other reasons for this being the case other than to wear them. On the second and third points, I do not think they were worn around the waist. Rather, they appear to have been worn over one shoulder across the chest like a gunslinger like a gunslinger's bandolier. This is because I believe stone collars and three-pointers were important props in Taino public ceremony. On the, first, on the fourth point, whether stone collars were used by ball players, I feel the evidence is rather tenuous. I'm more inclined to think that they were worn in other types of public ceremonies. They may have been used in ritual theater. End quote. Oh, that was a quote by Walker. If such stone rings were like a gunslinger's bandolier hung over one shoulder, they could only be worn for brief periods and they could weigh up to 80 pounds. Given their weight and bulk, it's most unlikely that they were used in ball games, where agility is essential. Furthermore, the attachment of yet another icon, the three-pointed semi, to the stone collar certainly rules out their actual use in ball games. In sum, like Walker, I think that because three-pointed stones were tied to stone collars, they were more likely to be used and displayed in ritual theater and ceremonial activities rather than mere stone representations of the pads and other belt paraphernalia used by ballplayers. I'm mystified by the fact that not one single Spaniard ever mentioned these collars as they're certainly of unusual shape and visually arresting and at odds with anything the Spaniards would have been familiar with back in the Mediterranean. I can only guess that their function was so obvious to the Spanish that it did not require further comment, or more likely that these collars were of such central value and importance to the native elite that the natives admirably succeeded in hiding them from public view. Okay, guys, so I think we're getting close to the hour mark, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here at part D of chapter 15, I believe, and uh, we'll pick... We'll pick up right here at page 130, 131-ish uh, in the next video.